Welcome back. Welcome back. It is my joy to introduce our next speaker. It is my joy to introduce our next speaker, Heidi Robbins. I remember when I met Heidi, I felt as if I was meeting a daughter. Considering I have four sons and no daughters, this was an exquisite moment. <laughs> I, I, the feeling of meeting a daughter is seeing in someone your very best qualities, which you hope to develop and you see in this next generation. And so, in meeting Heidi, I saw a wonderful fusion of masculine and feminine. A woman who could express love through all of herself. And Heidi, as I've seen her develop, is a wonderful director, actor, poet, astrologer, and mother. Quite appropriately, Heidi is going to speak on love. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Good. Thank you, Lawson. That was beautiful. Um, Lawson began uh, this morning's meditation with gratitude, and I want to begin the same way. I feel very, very grateful to be here with all of you. Uh, I feel rather like this is an extended family I've grown up around. Um, I was thinking this morning that you know, I was, I was probably one of the few children that grew up drawing chakras at the kitchen table, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my father used to sit outside our bedroom when I would go to sleep at night, and he would sit outside on this big flowery pillow, and he would meditate until we fell asleep. So I would, I would cry out if he weren't there, you know, when we were going to sleep, I'd say, meditate, Dad! You know, <laughs> so, um, and, and, you know, I was also thinking about how, when I was much younger, you know, Keith Bailey would come over and he and my father would go to full moon meditations in New York City and not many of my friends had that going on. Um, so, you know, when I look out, I, there, there are people that I have grown up with and I feel so deeply grateful to, you know, to Marianne, to Keith, to Sheldon, to Helena, to Tuya, to Glenda and Bill, and uh, I think of Annie Mueller, who some of you knew, and I feel so deeply grateful to her. And, you know, I too was one of the very few that was at the stable the very first year. <laughs> Although I think I just showed up and sort of looked and said, how did he get these people here? And, you know, now look at us. So it's quite beautiful. So, I would like to begin the talk with some poetry because I feel like poetry takes us to a different place. And when we listen to poetry, we listen with all of our being. We listen with our mind, but we listen with our heart, and we listen with our entire body. And uh, the first poem that I'd like to share with you is by a poet named Naomi Shiab Nye. And it's called Eye to Eye. Please forgive this interruption. I am forging a career, a delicate enterprise of eyes, <coughs> yours included. We will meet at the corner, you with your sack lunch, me with my guitar. We will be wearing our famous street faces, anonymous as trees. Suddenly you will see me, you will blink, hesitant, then realize I have not looked away. For one brave second, we will stare openly from borderless skins. This is my salary. There are no days off. 
Please forgive this interruption. I am forging a career, a delicate enterprise of eyes, yours included. We will meet at the corner, you with your sack lunch, me with my guitar. We will be wearing our famous street faces, anonymous as trees. Suddenly, you will see me. You will blink, hesitant, then realize I have not looked away. For one brave second, we will stare openly from borderless skins. This is my salary. There are no days off. And the second poem that I would like to share is by David White, who some of you probably know. And um, he wrote this poem based on one of the stories from the Bible when Jesus beckons to Peter to walk across the water. And he begins to walk across, and then he loses his faith. So this is called The True Love. <coughs> there is a faith in loving fiercely the one who is rightfully yours, especially if you have waited years, and especially if part of you never believed you could deserve this loved and beckoning hand held out to you this way. I am thinking of faith now and the testaments of loneliness, of what we feel we are worthy of in this world. Years ago in the Hebrides, I remember an old man who walked every morning on the gray stones to the shore of baying seals, who would press his hat to his chest in the blustering salt wind and say his prayer to the turbulent Jesus hidden in the water. And I think of the story of the storm and everyone waking and seeing the distant yet familiar figure far across the water calling to them and how we are all preparing for that abrupt waking and that calling and that moment we have to say yes, except it will not come so grandly, so biblically, but more subtly and intimately in the face of the one you know you have to love. So that when we finally step out of the boat toward them, we find everything holds us and everything confirms our courage. And if you wanted to drown, you could, but you don't, because finally, after all this struggle and all these years, you don't want to anymore. You've simply had enough of drowning. <laughs> and you want to live, and you want to love, and you will walk across any territory and any darkness, however fluid and however dangerous, to take the one hand you know belongs in yours. So this morning I want to talk about love. And I want to talk about staring openly from borderless skins. About walking across any territory and any darkness to take the hand of love. I want to talk about the courage that it takes to choose love and then choose it again. And I want to talk about how we can more fully and consistently realize the love that has been and forever will be. I want to tell you that I do not take this lightly. <laughs> it does not do to act as if it's a simple thing to choose love over fear. It isn't simple. It is not simple. It's a life practice. How do we live love? How do we extend love where it is most needed? And frankly, it is most needed everywhere. <laughs> there is not one among us who does not need to step ever more deeply into the stream of love. There is not one among us who could not stand to be more of a conduit for the most pure, life-giving energy in our solar system. There is not one among us that could not stand to open these arms in invocation to welcome more love into our every days. But hear this, hear what we already know. We've been working at living love for thousands of years 
and still haven't been able to figure out how to love our neighbor. Of this postulate, love your neighbor as yourself, DK wrote, to this we have paid as yet but little attention. We have loved ourselves and have sought to love those we like, but to love universally and because our neighbor is a soul as we are, with a nature essentially perfect and an infinite des destiny, this has always been regarded as a beautiful dream to be consummated in a future so distant and in a heaven so far away that we may well forget it. 2,000 years have gone since the greatest expression of God's love walked on earth and bade us love each other. Yet still we fight and hate and use our powers for selfish ends, our bodies and our appetites for material pleasures, and our efforts at living are, in the mass, primarily directed towards personal selfishness. This mystery of learning how to love is a great paradox. Walk down the street. Look into people's eyes. There is hunger, heaviness, sorrow, doubt, everywhere. Then turn within. Grow silent. Listen. Listen to your steady heartbeat. Listen to what beats in and through us all. And know that love, the greatest healing agent ever, is inextricably woven through everything, ceaselessly present, ceaselessly available to be chosen. Or if you say, no, no, I can't do that. I can't believe that. I don't feel that. Then be a skeptic, by all means, but experiment. Experiment with the idea that love is all there is and is always available. And if we, for this moment, choose to believe that, then we ask the question, how is it that we again and again and again ignore the key that is waiting to unlock a new world? How do we can so consistently choose misery over love? So recently I was at the Starbucks with my, my two and a half year old daughter, Kate. And uh, I should say I wanted to buy a chai at Starbucks, and Kate was having a meltdown. So we're in Starbucks, we're in the line, and suddenly she's thick in the middle of a terrible two tantrum. So before I can order, I, I pick her up and I head outside, and she's screaming, and I'm doing my best to calm her down. And a man comes out, and he says, oh, hey, hey, let me order your drink for you. And, and I say, oh, no, 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 that's okay, that's okay. I, 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 did, I don't have any cash, I was just going to charge it, that's okay. He says, oh, oh, no, no, then let me, it's, let, me, let me get you your coffee. He said, my kids, my kids were like that this morning, let me get you your coffee. I know what it's like. So Kate screams louder. <laughs> and I say, oh, no, 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 that's okay, that's okay. I, I say, and I'm miserable with Kate, and I want my chai, and I'm miserable. And for whatever reason, I am unable to let this man do something lovely for me. Come on, he says, it's no big deal. I'd love to buy you a coffee. <laughs> so... Finally, I give in, and I, and I, th I say, that, that's so lovely of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I say, and I, I think of the least expensive drink on the menu. <laughs> and I say, okay, I'll, I'll have a small coffee. I don't drink coffee. Okay? <laughs> so <laughs> he says, no, no, let me get you a latte or something. And I say, he said, what can I get you? And I, and I can barely let this kindness in, this love, right? So I say, Okay, thank you. And, and I still don't ask for the chai that I actually want. I say, a, a cappuccino would be lovely. <laughs> and even though I don't drink coffee, and the cappuccino is perfect. And Kate stops crying shortly after he hands it to me. And I am eternally grateful to Kip. I ask his name when he hands me the drink. And I'm also amazed at how difficult it was to allow this generosity, this loving kindness in. So think of Kip as love knocking, okay? I could barely open the door wide enough to let anything squeeze through. So we all have our ways of refusing the love that is everywhere. And why? Why do we refuse this love? Or why do we refuse to love? It takes strength to stand in the doorway of such light. It takes strength to hold open the door when an equally strong and opposing force attempts to slam it shut. It takes will and determination and ferocity to choose love. But do we not have some modicum of that ferocity in our makeup? 
Can we not summon the warriors within us to win the day for the good, for the light, for love, at least a little more often? The question must be asked in truth. Do we want, do we want to create suffering or love through our bodies? or our vehicles, because we are always either opening or closing. Every word we speak, every gesture we make is an opportunity to open or close. So why is it so difficult to open and to find a way into the answer that is everywhere about us? I'm asking these questions for myself, and I'm asking these questions for all of us. There are two things I know. There is a love that never ceases. There is a love that never ceases. And we must realize this now. <laughs> we must begin to realize this love, make it real, reveal it in everything we say and do. I want to tell you the truth. I want you to tell yourselves your truths, because we must always begin with what is real for us now. So here is a portrait, a portrait of one struggling to love. Here's what I'm feeling most of the time. I'm not doing enough. There isn't enough time. I want caffeine. Is everyone happy? Should I be doing something to make sure everyone is happy? I feel like I'm lucky, like my family is blessed. I feel angular, apologetic, guilty, like a control freak, inflexible. My hamstrings have always been an issue. <laughs> I feel flirty, happy in my body at 39. I feel like I want to be loved. Here are some of my bad habits. I bite my nails, I always have. I drink too much Earl Grey tea. I absorb other people's eating habits. I don't always tell it like it is. I think I need to take care of everyone. I often feel lethargic or panicked. I think about loss too much. I'm not great with money. I advocate love and then gossip about how negative someone is. <laughs> I like to be first in line. I eat a lot of sugar. I waffle. I'm scared to state strong opinions. I always bruise my legs. I avoid conflict. I go numb. Here's what I've been working on in my life. Intimacy, feeling like a rushing river, opening, surrendering, not freaking out about perfection, releasing control. Did I say surrendering? <laughs> I did. Surrendering. Here are a few other things that defy a category. My knees are getting creaky. I don't brush Kate's teeth often enough. I don't clean my house the way I should. I spot clean, OK? <laughs> I collect clutter. I am a backseat driver. I don't like cheap fabric on my body. And I can't sit still. <laughs> but why tell you this? Why speak these temporal truths? Because in speaking them, in laughing at them, in holding them up to the light of day, I can hear the great beat of truth beneath every seeming imperfection. None of this matters. None of this matters. As David White writes, I want to live, and I want to love, and I will walk across any territory and any darkness to do so. I hear the truth that I can and must and want to be a force of love in the world. I want to be the love that I am. I want to be one with the rushing river of love that is everywhere and ever available. I want to dare to hear it, to surrender to its flow. And all I can do is practice. Fail, 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 and begin again. Practice. So I want to tell you about my hello love experiment. These days, I often greet my daughter and my husband with hello love. And sometimes I greet my friends this way too, and it feels natural and it feels wonderful to say. So then while I was sitting in Starbucks the other morning, my office away from home, <laughs> it occurred to me that I could do an experiment. I began to wonder how I could expand the love circle. So naming something is a powerful thing. 
If you call, if, if, if I call you love and mean it, it resonates in both of us. Now don't worry, I'm not gonna suggest that you greet everyone with hello love. I'm only going to suggest that you think it. It's actually pretty remarkable. I started doing this as I, as I watched people come and go through the Starbucks store, and also when I headed home, and I silently greeted my fellow walkers with hello love. And I couldn't stop smiling because there is something so delicious about this. It takes the critical mind or the fear-based mind or the separative mind right out of commission. And instead, I found myself immediately seeing what was most light in each of the people that I greeted, what was most realized love. And I felt full of appreciation. Also, I felt like I had some kind of fabulous secret, like I could be a Johnny Appleseed of love on a quiet morning walk. Of course, one can't help but see the grunkly, broken, wretched parts too. But with the hello love experiment, they are secondary. At least for a split second, they are secondary. And if we add together all our split seconds of love, we begin to change the world. So try it and see what you think. In fact, try it right now. <laughs> oh no, oh no, just take a deep breath. A deep breath, and those of you that can turn without being creaky, turn around, take a look at somebody, and without, th without saying a word, just think, hello, love, and breathe a full breath. Do it with two people. Go ahead, go ahead, be brave, be daring. A full breath, don't look away so fast. One more person. Hello, love. <laughs> There you go. I always hate it when people make me do things like that, but, um, <laughs> but there you go. Just, just practice it and let me know at the end of the conference how it feels, all right? And, um, it was actually my birthday a couple of days ago and I had told one of my dear friends about this and I was all excited about it. And, um, she said, oh, I want to try that too. And she picked me up and I had invited six of my friends for brunch, six of my women friends for brunch. And she picked me up and we were driving along and uh, suddenly, about five blocks down, there was a huge sign and it said, hello, love. And I was like, <gasps> and I was like applauding and I was, you know, I was just so thrilled and I looked at her and she smiled and we drove along and like three blocks later, hello, love. And, you know, of course she had gotten up early and put all these hello, love signs. And, and I live in Los Angeles, okay, so we're driving along Melrose and La Brea and all these guys are hanging out, you know, waiting for the bus or drunk or whatever, you know, and it's like, hello, love, and I mean, I wanted her to go back and take pictures of this because it was so fabulous. I think she should make it into a whole art project, you know, because the most wonderful characters were right there beneath the hello, love signs, and I have to say it even affirmed it even more, just seeing that and thinking most people drive along and see garage sale signs, you know, and, to be greeted at, in Los Angeles in the morning with hello, love, I think it's the key. Okay, so another thing that I've been experimenting with is movement. So when I feel stuck of late in the land of doubt or fear or depression or wretchedness, lands that I visit fairly frequently, I've been moving, not running or swimming or doing yoga, but moving simply like this. Or like this. Or like this. <laughs> and I've been imagining with that tiny movement that I'm moving myself into a stream of love, a river of love that is flowing just to my right or my left or just above me or below me. And if I stand on my tiptoes or move my hips, if I choose to, I am suddenly awash in this streaming love. Now, this is a lovely experiment, it's quaint. I hear you say, it's incomplete. It doesn't quite paint a true picture. Why is love moving all around you and not in you? This is esoterically flawed. <laughs> we are that love after all. We are inextricably linked with it. It is not simply rushing by us. But this movement reminds me, this shift reminds me of that truth. Movement creates choice. Every movement, and dare I say every word we speak, we can choose whether to consciously be part of the great flow or not. We all know how few and fleeting the moments are that we live as love in action with a kind of rhythmic consistency. 
that we know ourselves to be the love that we are. So that's why I play this game, this hokey pokey of love, if you will. And uh, I dip my hand in, my arm, my toe, my ear, and I remember that the loving choice is always available. The loving action is always possible to take. And then too, if I turn my head to the right or to the left and I see a friend, I think, look there. There he is, awash in the rushing river of love. He is part of the great rush of love available to me daily. He may be fighting the river or not even aware that it exists, but he's in it. He's a part of it. So I'm looking at love. I am looking at love in some process of being realized. So I want to take this movement, this shift of perspective, this dance, if you will, a little further because the moment that we begin to shift, to test the waters, to play in the waters, a dance begins. And a dance is sacred and joyous and celebratory and alive. A dance is not stuck. It's a peekaboo with the divine flow. My daughter Kate can watch me disappear and reappear from behind a silk scarf for hours. She laughs with delight every time I surprise her. So she knows I'm there all along, but she finds such joy in seeing me afresh each time. So like Kate, I dance with this river. I feel grumpy, I feel tired. Could there really be an endless flowing forgiving river to carry me instantly to a different place? I lean in, is it so? Is there another choice in this moment, one that will offer strength, relief, beauty, courage, all in one small shift? Is it so? I shift, I breathe, I breathe, I breathe. It takes a lot of breathing, and there it is. It's available, it's never ceasing, offering all of itself, offering to Carry me for a time. The water of love will always offer another choice. I am not always, and I will say most often, not able to make that choice. But I know it is there. And I can hear the river. I know it is there. In Discipleship in the New Age 2, DK writes, the great preventative to any growing hardness or rigidity of perception is love. And the great lesson for all disciples is to love more and more until the day be with us. So we hear the river. We know the river. We know its power. We still feel too much the bones and flesh of the body to feel one with it, to make the choice to swim consistently in its current. We still feel too much the rigidities and habitual movement to dance the dance of the free river but we can begin to work with it. We can begin to call to it, to invoke it, to be conscious of the times we can welcome it into our lives or the times we can plunge into the ride. We learn to make our bodies, our temples, into an invocative appeal. Fill me, fill me, fill me. So we meditate, we pray, we invoke, we work, we do the work we are meant to do. We practice harmlessness, right speech. We find our way to welcome the waters of love, the love that never ceases. And at first, we learn to love ourselves. We learn to forgive ourselves, to put aside guilt, to take care of our bodies, to mend our broken pieces, to restore a sense of value. We tend to the personality, our vessel, so that a pure, free, unimpeded flow of true love can begin to pour through. And this great rushing river of love carries away that all that is not truly who you are. It carries away self-loathing. It carries away fear. It offers to carry anything that is inhabiting your dark corners where only light wants to live. But then there comes a time when we are healed enough. No, not completely, but enough. We are wet enough. We have begun to know the river and we can share it. We in fact must share it because we are becoming it. We tell stories of the river, we guide others to its shore, we teach them how to listen, 
We teach them what we know of how it came to be, how it has shaped everything that is. We cup our hands, dip them into the river, and offer our friends a drink. We share our own struggles with the river, with allowing the river into our lives. We are playful and moving and strong like the river, and we become water bearers for all who cannot believe that such a rushing river of endless purifying love could possibly exist. DK writes, above everything else in life, give to all who seek your aid the fullest measure of love. For love releases, love adjusts and interprets, and love heals on all three planes. It's from Esoteric Healing. Do you see how it might happen if you turn your head or reach your hand into the current that is and has forever been swirling about you and in you, if you dare to shift your perspective and catch a glimpse of the potency of love, you will find that your movements have become this beautiful dance, and it calls out to others, and you can teach that dance, that dance with the great rushing river, and you will share your sadnesses, your heartbreaks, your pain, your brokenness, and in the sharing, the dance will grow and will unify, and the dance will be a dance that you cannot do alone. And you will find yourself suddenly still with your group, standing knee deep in the river of love. And you will find you have become a chalice to be poured forth. And you will find exquisite moments of love realized in the dance of the group. And that which has been realized can be poured out to those who need its nourishment most. DK writes, let not your love remain theoretical. Let not your love remain theoretical, but give that true understanding which ignores mistakes, recognizes no barriers, refuses all separating thoughts, and surrounds each other with that protecting wall of love that meets all need wherever possible, physical, emotional, and mental. Let not your love remain theoretical. We are mostly water already, are we not? Our world is mostly water already. The rushing river of love is moving through us. It whispers to us every moment to awaken to its current, to join the flow, to become part of the blessing, to love anything and everything that you find on your path. When I read the first poem of this talk to my husband, he said, I love it. He said, I love that poem because we as humanity rarely look at one another. We never stare openly at one another. He said, that's, he said, that's why we go to the theater or film, so that we can stare at people, so that we can look into their eyes. Do you know how many times, I mean, like I'm driving along in LA and I look to the side and, and I'm like, hmm, and then, oh, you look, you know, I got caught looking, right? So, <laughs> but, I mean, the eyes are the window to the soul, a window to the heart, and we never look. Children look. Children look at us, and with their eyes, they say, who are you? They ask, are you love? What is your name? They ask, what is your song? Sing me your song, they say. Soothe me with your song. Let me know that you are love, that you will hold me. But as adults, we share our eyes, our hearts, cautiously. We stand next to each other in elevators, and we don't make a sound, and we exchange money without looking at each other. I mean, lately, I've really been like, I'm trying to look up when I buy my chai, and go, who is that? Hi, you know, 7-Eleven guy, who are you? You know, we don't look at each other. We, we, we move through our day avoiding contact, and yet we yearn for this shared experience of love. So we need to slow down, to grow still, to look at the man who is handing us our coffee. There's a quote that I love by Do Hyun Cho, and it goes like this. Stillness is what creates love. Movement is what creates life. To be still and still moving 
This is everything. Stillness is what creates love. Movement is what creates life. To be still and still moving, this is everything. We begin to realize love as we begin to find our stillness, inner poise. How do you find stillness? I walk, I dance, I do yoga sometimes. Lately, I've been painting watercolor with Kate. The stillness comes even in movement because the chatter falls away and a great interior opening, a calm, a point of receptivity replaces the chaos. And it is only in that stillness that we can hear the heart, that we can fully experience it. Stillness is what creates love, makes room for it, realizes it, looks both in and out into the world to recognize it. And then the opportunity is to carry ourselves as love, as stillness, into the life, 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 life of our world. A certain steady heartbeat amidst the discord, to be still and still moving. This is our possibility, our practice, to slow down and make contact, to, as DK says, surround each other with a protecting wall of love that meets all need whenever possible. You know, so often it is our own inner discord that disrupts the stillness before anyone else. But if the intention is strong, we will return to that stillness again and again. DK gives the affirmation, at the center of all love, I stand and naught can touch me here. And from that center, I shall go forth to love and serve. So imagine standing at the center of all love in stillness. Imagine knowing we are that love. Imagine moving forward carried by the river and as water bearers, awakening in others what has been revealed to us. All this is possible now. DK wrote of the reappearance of the Christ, when he appears, the light that has always been will be seen, the love that never ceases will be realized, and the radiance deep concealed will break forth into being. We shall then have a new world, one which will express the light, the love, and the knowledge of God in a crescendo of revelation. The love that never ceases will be realized in a crescendo of revelation. My daughter Kate, at 18 months old, could not yet say the word love. So instead of saying, I love you, she would say, I you, <laughs> I you. I, you. Is this not the simplest answer to so many of our troubles? Is this not how we begin the journey of love realized? Dip your finger in. Listen to its roar. Choose the ride, the ride of love. And for all those you meet along the way, those resisting, those partaking, Nod your head, greet them, stare openly from borderless skins. I, you, I, you, I, you.